pledge our colleagues from the Pacific community, uh, from uh, Gary Lee and Robert Smith and Aquila Tawake, uh, from Fiji's Mineral Resources Department, in particular Ray, uh, Raymond Muhammad, and the uh, Permanent Secretary, um, Her Excellency Dr. Tanga, um, as well as uh, colleagues from UNDP, uh, Izzy Kelly uh, and De Gaulle. So sand, uh, sand, gravel and crushed stone. Collectively, we use the term aggregate to describe that group of uh, minerals. It's produced from all different types of circumstances and has a quite wide range of sustainability issues associated with that production. Most people wouldn't realize that it's the most utilized material by humans other than water. Uh, so it's really fundamental to our everyday lives. Uh, we produce it from crushing stone. Uh, we might gather sand uh, and gravel from waterways, from terrestrial deposits. Um, and each of those different circumstances will have different sustainability challenges. In the world, we currently produce around 50 billion tonnes of sand, gravel and crushed stone per year. Most of that is in Asia, um, in particular China and India. Um, and so the, about 30 billion tonnes or just over will be just from the Asian region. Um, Oceania is just a small amount. Right. So we're only responsible in the Pacific um, and Oceania region for around 1% of global production. But as a per, per capita basis, we're actually quite high. And one of the reasons for that is uh, the issue of uh, disaster reconstruction uh, and the necessary, um, the need to rebuild after tropical cyclones, um, in some places, earthquakes, etc. Now, we don't have good data on sand and gravel um, production globally. Uh, and so we here I'm just showing some data from the European Union um, and you'll see that um, on the left hand graph, about half of the uh, aggregates mined in the world comes from crushing stone. Um, about 40% is sand and gravel that is taken from the natural environment. A part of that uh, comes from sand deposits that are terrestrial sand deposits and another part will come from waterway. So uh, extraction from rivers or perhaps from the ocean. Um, only a small amount is currently recycled, uh, but there's huge potential for that. What is it used for? Well, it's used for railway ballast. It's used for building um, roads, rail bridges. Um, it's used for as asphalt. It's used for concrete. That's a huge um, um, component of the aggregate worldwide. Um, so there it makes up about 40%. Um, and then unbound materials, so sub-base for roads or, or other things. Um, and you know, there's a wide range of infrastructure that um, sand and gravel is being used for, uh, which is really important to the kind of um, uh, achievement of the sustainable development goals. Now, in comparison to other parts of uh, the mineral sector, um, the construction material and industrial minerals part of the sector is huge. So we're talking nearly 85% of global production is from industrial minerals and construction materials. And most of that is from sand. So you see this line that's this bar chart that's going back and forth onto itself, that is sand production. And you see that it's by far much greater production than any other part of the mineral sector. Everyone in their minds, when they think of mining, they'll think of metals, they'll think of maybe gold mining or, or iron ore mining that only actually makes up 2.8% of global mineral production. Uh, so uh, this part of the sector is very neglected and very under um, acknowledged for its uh, large scale. To share, to compare to some other commodities, so 50 billion tonnes per year of sand, gravel and crushed stone, only 2,000 tonnes per year of gold. Uh, so that's a huge difference. Um, and this is a, a graph from the OECD we see that um, this is global production of different commodities, sand and gravel and crushed stone is at the top there. Um, it's showing production as of 2011 and then projecting into the future. You see that a huge amount of material and by far the largest increase in um, use of mineral commodities will come from sand, gravel and crushed stone as, as the world urbanizes, as infrastructure is built and those infrastructure deficits are, are, are erased. Now, let me give you a comparison just to show you how big the difference is. Total historic production of gold fits into roughly three Olympic sized swimming pools. That's all gold ever produced by humans in our history. All of it would fit in three Olympic sized swimming pools. Sand, gravel, and crushed stone would not fit into 10 million Olympic sized swimming pools, just its yearly production. All right, so what does it mean for the Pacific region? Well, understanding production of aggregate and sand is very difficult. There's not a lot of data. 
Um, so what we set out to do is we worked with the United Nations Development Program and the African Caribbean Pacific Group of States and EU with their ACP EU Development Risk Program. It's a program that I used to lead when I worked at UNDP to do a baseline assessment of development minerals. These are the local minerals and materials used in local development uh, in Fiji. Um, most of the mining in Fiji is uh, mining of um, sand, gravel and crushed stone or to a lesser extent limestone used in agriculture. As part of our study, we identified 86 sites and 76% were actually located in Fiji's rivers. Uh, we also identified 30 unregulated extraction sites and we inspected a large number of those sites. Um, total production was 3 million um, metres cubed, uh, which was eight times higher than official reported production. So a lot of um, this type of mining globally is actually informal and unregulated. Uh, but the value of the sector was seven times larger than previously reported. And the, the government was receiving 81% lower royalties than was anticipated from that assessment. Uh, and we also found that there's a lot of challenges in the current legal and regulatory framework for the sector. Some highlights, um, there's a huge issue around sand and gravel extraction from rivers and waterways. It's creating a lot of environmental and um, so, social challenges. And Fiji, as a result of our study, actually committed to shift from river sand to grab, uh, production to hard rock quarries, which uh, the sustainable development issues are, are much less acute uh, than extracting from natural waterways. The sector is um, actually um, locally dominated, so it's um, majority owned by Fijian companies. Like many parts of the world, it's really local, uh, a local industry. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, and um, Fiji is actually supplying a lot of material to other parts of the Pacific. But with that comes a lot of challenges around capacity building uh, for the quarries, which are often family owned quarries uh, working in the sector. Women make up only 4% of the workforce in Fiji, whereas we've done baseline studies for lots of different countries. And uh, in globally, it's around 40% of, um, of the sector is uh, actually female um, uh, workforce. Um, so in Fiji, where it tends to be a little bit more formal than other parts of the world, that number is very low. And there's some reasons for that, which perhaps we can discuss uh, in question time later. What I wanted to get to today um, was really this issue around disaster reconstruction and preparedness because um, quarried materials play a huge role, a crucial role in reconstruction of housing and infrastructure following natural disasters. And at the moment, they're not incorporated into the disaster planning process. And therefore it's very difficult to receive, uh, to achieve resilient and sustainable development outcomes as a result of natural disasters. So the main tool that we use in um, disaster planning is the PDNA, the Post-Disaster Needs Assessment. It, it's there to assess the disaster effects and impacts uh, on priority uh, and to de determine priority recovery areas. Um, in its Disaster Recovery Framework Guide, the Global Facility for Disaster um, uh, Reconstruct uh, Reduction and Recovery actually provides um, recommendations for the content of PDNAs and identifies different economic sectors requiring analysis and mining is actually included uh, in that, but none of the 10 PDNAs um, developed since 2015 have actually analyzed the impact of the quarry sector. And yet it's the sector that provides a majority of materials for reconstruction. Um, there is no guidance for assessing pre-disaster capacity in the quarry sector um, or the availability of construction materials um, there's, there's huge gaps currently in, in, in the system uh, in all of the PDNAs that, that we've reviewed. And let me give you a quick case study. Um, so we did some work around tropical uh, cyclone Winston in 2016, uh, reportedly the most intense tropical cyclone in the Southern Hemisphere. In Fiji, it resulted in more than 30,000 houses um, uh, damaged, uh, 500 schools, 88 health clinics, there were 44 fatalities. There was a, a PDNA published in 2016. Um, it assessed the economic impact of the metal mines on the island, but didn't look at the 86 extraction sites that look at construction materials. In post-disaster needs, um, you really need construction materials rather than um, the importance of um, metal production, which is exported overseas. Um, so this left a huge gap. Uh, there was significant damage to a large proportion of the quarries uh, from, from Winston. And that impacted supply, 
there was already a lot of pressure on supply because of road building. And there was, as a result, shortages of construction material ran out of, running, uh, out of cement in 2017. So you can see that you know, the impacts are real, the scale is large, um, and our planning system is currently not coping uh, with this very important part of the sector. We wanted to amend that, so we worked with the uh, Pacific Community and the uh, Mineral Resources Department in Fiji to develop a new type of tool, a damage and capacity assessment um, that we administered as part of um, recovery efforts after Yasa. Um, and we did that in the extraction sites um, across um, uh, uh, the affected areas. Uh, the assessment allowed the department to sort of kind of anticipate how much construction material would be available and where it would support necessary, which of the quarries are impacted. Uh, we revealed a quarter of a million uh, Fiji dollars in damage across 10 quarries um, in the impacted region of uh, Banua level. Um, and there was an average drop of around 49% in production capacity. This um, was not as widespread as the impact of Winston. It, we didn't run into short shortages and the department had information available about where they could get uh, quarried materials as a result of this new tool that we developed. Um, interestingly, only two of the 10 impacted sites held insurance. So you can see that it's very difficult for this sector to recover as well after natural disasters. All right, so what do we think is needed uh, for strengthening this sector? Apart from um, having better sector analysis in the PDNAs, uh, there's probably opportunity for working with quarry sites on disaster readiness and emergency planning. We think that there's work that can be done around pre-disaster planning, whether it's stockpiles, sector mobilization plans, emergency contingency for accessing resources, uh, whether it's emergency licensing procedures. We think we can have better quality control over the minerals and materials that are produced in disaster settings because some infrastructure projects really need that. Um, there's potential to use debris, construction debris um, and recycle it. Um, there's potential for urban mining. There's also a role for um, promoting local customs in architecture from these local materials, um, as well as in, uh, engaging the workforce in this sector in post-disaster recovery, uh, and then thinking regionally about our regional solutions. So we're working across these areas. Um, we'd invite partners and we'd invite um, uh, funders of, of this work to really strengthen uh, the capacity across the region. We have some projects that are related to this already underway. We're doing a regional baseline. Uh, we've proposed to do a regional baseline with the Pacific Regional Infrastructure Facility. Um, we're also working on alternate um, uh, low carbon cement options in the Pacific with our colleagues at uh, IITD in India, um, as well as, um, as Tara. And we've got some funding from the UQ Global Seed Funding Scheme for that. We're continuing to work with the ACP EU Development Minerals Program on capacity building on these topics. And we're working with UNESCO on a new program led by uh, Dr. Flommenhoff on work integrated learning. So having graduates of um, uh, the um, engineering fields and technical fields and, and development um, studies fields working into the development mineral sector uh, in the Pacific to kind of uh, uh, get some uh, exposure and um, interest in these type of topics. Uh, I'll leave uh, you with uh, some links um, in my slide pack uh, for people that like to learn more and hand back over to Susan. Uh, Suzanne, sorry, um, uh, for the rest of the, the session. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Daniel, for keeping to the time. And I wonder whether you have the ability to share the links eventually, perhaps with our organizers, so they can pop them in for the participants to access, because I'm not sure where they can access your slides after we've taken them off. OK, no worries. Hopefully that is possible. Um, I didn't see any questions put forth in the Q&A at this stage, which is kind of, you know, maybe people are still getting going and thinking about it, but I do want to thank Professor Frank for a very interesting presentation on a topic that, as you said, probably is not so much talked about, but obviously quite important resource for the Pacific. And, um, and I do appreciate all the recommendations and the regional focus that you suggested in it. So hopefully, um, are there any questions? Um, can you please put any questions in the Q&A if you do have them? 
I'll turn and Suzanne, it. I'll be I'll be happy to answer those questions in the QA in, in written form while the other okay. presenters are speaking. So if people want to add things, please do. Oh, brilliant, Daniel. Um, I appreciate that. So because I haven't actually seen any yet, and it's, um, I'm trying to also look at the Hoover platform at the same time. Yeah. All are still a bit new to this format, but you are correct. You can do in written. Of course, you can always just uh, as well speak, um, approach Doc, um, Professor Franks directly. Um, there's the one actually question now that just came in. So why don't we take that one question before moving on? Is the Stone for Development Initiative part of the new Colombo plan? Professor Franks, can you answer that question? Because I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, it is currently not part of the new Colombo plan because um, applications last year for that uh, program were halted because of COVID. Uh, but we have uh, pre made preparations to uh, make a submission for that program. We do have funding from UNESCO though. And uh, so we will be um, involving um, participants from the Pacific to come to uh, the uh, Stone for Development um, Work Integrated Learning Workshop um, we plan to do that face-to-face -face in Fiji in a post-COVID environment. In the meantime, it'll probably be a virtual program, um, but uh, we, it, we have a five-year funding horizon from UNESCO, so it's something that we'll be developing over time. Please contact myself or Gary Flomenhoft if, you, if you're interested in, in being involved. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Professor Franks. And I think I'm going to take, um, take you up on moving on now because of time, because we are on a tight time schedule. So thank you again, Professor Frank, for your presentation. And we're moving on to the next presentation now. And please keep asking questions. Professor Franks has said that he'll answer them. You can also contact him on the Hoover platform under participants. Um, the next paper is presented by three individuals. Um, is about challenge and opportunities for Pacific women's participation in technical and vocational education and training. I just had to Google that little acronym. Um, it'll be largely co-presented by Aidan Crani from La Trobe University. Aidan is a development scholar and consultant attached to the Institute for Human Security and Social Change at La Trobe. And his research looks at youth and civic engagement livelihoods in the Pacific and the practical and philosophical challenges for aid donors in supporting locally led development in practice. Um, the second presenter is Alessandra, although Sandra Mel, from the Partnership Coalition Facilitator for Australian Pacific Training Coalition in the PNG country office in Port Mosby. Thank you for dialing in so far, Sandra. Sandra has uh, been in this role since 2019, providing technical support to the country director and management of her or a project's institutional partnership and the identification and support of locally owned, driven and led reforms in the, in the TVET sector in PNG. Um, she's currently pursuing her accreditation in partnership brokering and um, has been working with that approach over time and particularly looking at locally owned analysis in the context of the partnerships and the evidence base for thinking and working politically. And apologies, Sandra, I slightly abbreviated your bio. So Aidan and Alessandra will largely be presenting. And at the end, we have Geraldine Tyson from DFAT providing some comments and wrapping it up. And she works with the Office of the Pacific and the Agenda Team in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade with oversight of a range of Australian government and development programs focusing on or mainstreaming gender equality so I just quickly want to hand over now and I'm going to turn myself off and Aidan and Sandra, I'm going to give you time. Uh... Okay, thanks for that, Suzanne. I hope that uh, I'm popping up on everyone's uh, screen now. Um, so good morning and thanks for attending this session. Uh, as introduced by Suzanne just then, my name's Aidan Crenny. Um, and I'm attached to the Institute for Human Security and Social Change at La Trobe University. Uh, and I will be co-presenting, as, as Suzanne said, uh, with Alessandra Mel from APTC, the Australia Pacific Technical Coalition, or Training Coalition, um, and Geraldine Tyson from DFAT. In this uh, presentation, we'll be discussing the joint research project between APTC and La Trobe University into challenges and opportunities 
uh, for Pacific women's participation in uh, technical and vocational education and training and employment. Uh, before I begin, I would like to give a quick acknowledgement of country. So I am dialing in from Wurundjeri country here in Melbourne. Sandra is calling in from Hidabada country in Port Moresby and uh, Geraldine is on Ngunnawal country in Canberra. Uh, for this presentation, I'll provide some background information relating to women's engagement in vocational education and employment in the Pacific before detailing the collaborative approach uh, undertaken in this research project. Sandra will follow with a discussion of methods before we conclude by noting recommendations made by the research team and how APTC is uh, beginning to respond to them. Uh, Geraldine will then offer a brief uh, reflection before any Q&A. And my slide does not want to change for some reason. There we go. Okay, cool. Um, so across the Pacific, governments have acknowledged the importance of technical and vocational education and training as a key strategy for helping to drive economic growth and poverty reduction. Uh, regional and national policies and strategies recognise the role of TVET in reducing unemployment and equipping workers with technical skills that support the development of more productive local industries. TVET is also seen as opening up opportunities for people to work overseas and to send a proportion uh, of their income home. Uh, and remittances are, are really a key driver of, of Pacific economies. So this benefits both individual families and local Pacific economies. However, across the Pacific, women face a range of social, cultural, economic, and other barriers to participating in TVET and in domestic and overseas labor markets. And to date, there's been really limited empirical research on these barriers and how they can be addressed. In recognition of this, and as part of its ongoing commitment to gender equality and social inclusion, APTC conducted research into the issues that women in the Pacific face when considering or completing APTC training programs. This research aimed to understand the factors that limit women's participation in TBET or in labor migration programs. What factors uh, support them to actually engage in vocational education and employment? and how these intersect with other aspects of women's identities. By deepening understanding of these issues, the research aimed to generate recommendations to support APTC to deliver its programs in a way that enables women to achieve their potential in education and employment. Underpinning this research is an understanding that women's interests in training programs and in employment and labour mobility opportunities are shaped by broader discourses related to their, their socially accepted and socially acceptable roles in society, as well as their individual and collective aspirations. The research also took a, what, what can kind of be considered an applied intersectional approach. Um, so this was looking to understand how gender marginalization is compounded by other forms of marginalization specific to uh, the Pacific and specific to the context of women's engagement in vocational education and employment. So things like disability, ethnicity, marital status, motherhood, and location in rural and remote areas and small island states. This research project was run collaboratively through an established partnership where the Institute for Human Security and Social Change is the external monitoring, evaluation and learning partner for APTC. The project ran from September 2019 to July 2020 across the Latrobe office here in Melbourne, the APTC head office in Suva and four study sites where APTC delivers courses, uh, those four sites being Fiji, Kiribati, Papua New Guinea and Tonga. I'll now hand over to Sandra to discuss the research design and methods. Sandra. Thank you, Aidan. The research, as Aidan um, has spoken to, was done through a collaborative research design between the IHSSC and um, APTC staff. This was uh, done with the Institute providing training, remote training and support for APTC staff who are Pacific Island women who led data collection across four of its country campuses. So that's in Fiji, Kiribati, Tonga and PNG. The process of data collection was done through methods that were used. Um, these method, methods were uh, through key stakeholder interviews, 
These key stakeholder interviews were identified from government, industries, civil society, and APTC's institutional partners, as well as working in this, the methodology was focus group discussions with previous, um, current, and potential APTC students. For the focus group discussions, it was vital for the team to capture spoken word uh, as part of the research write-ups to provide the evidence for the key findings and recommendations. We used it because in the, we used it because it helped significance to cultural process for sharing of stories. And in Fiji, it's known as Talanoa. A Talanoa creates a, an equal place where all voices are heard and where everyone is equal and every voice is heard. This method enabled an open narrative approach, which was pivotal to creating a space that enabled women to tell their stories. This was valuable for the participants who acknowledged the value of sharing empowered, the value of sharing empowered them. The data collection was supported through the Institute at the Trove through debriefing after each country was visit, visited and data was collected. Then the Institute provided initial analysis and drafting of the research report and a collaborative approach through which the editing and refining was done. The experience from this partnership and collaboration has been a capacity building opportunity for APTC's budding Pacific women researchers who have gone ahead to author a blog and also workshopping a second blog for the second half of this year with the support of IHSSC. Thank you, Aidan. Um, thanks, Sandra. So perhaps not surprisingly, the main finding of this research was that women's participation in vocational education and employment is constrained by social and cultural norms that either explicitly encourage men to occupy certain roles or implicitly discourage women from occupying certain roles. Recognising the need to challenge social norms, recommendations broadly fall across three areas. Um, a need to encourage and provide enticements for, for more women, including those from disadvantaged groups, to enrol and to successfully complete TVET, including in uh, what are considered non-traditional courses for, for women to undertake, um, to support uh, TVET graduates to make a successful transition to employment, including through advocacy within the vocational employment sector, so APTC engaging with the broader employment sector, uh, and upskilling within APTC on gender and social inclusion issues, um, awareness and strategies. Uh, with this report handed to APTC in July last year, they are already enacting some of these responses, which Sandra will now discuss. As a result of this research, APTC has responded by developing these tangible knowledge products, like APTC's Jesse video, Jesse Report, a Jesse Brief, a Jesse Framework, and an ANU Dev Policy Blog. These provide the opportunities for APTC to prioritize women and other disadvantaged groups entering into non traditional fields, creating women only cohorts for non traditional fields, running Jesse training for APTC staff, and strengthening our existing relationships and partners with our existing relationships with partners who work in the Jesse space and in the TVET space in the region, in the region and at country level, such as Pacific Labor Facility and other workplaces for streamlining into employment. What else can we do? This is crucial when acknowledging that social norms will and do dictate opportunities for women. APTC through its program work can help drive these, but we understand that efforts can be fruitless without collective momentum from other stakeholders. In the TVET sector in the Pacific, it is necessary for employers to consider offering more support services, such as childcare, for example, other training providers and employers to create peer networks such as alumni chapters where it brings people to share their stories and that can build strength and resilience. Governments can identify priority areas for increased women engagement in partnership with employers and providers and create target and policy incentives to achieve this. APTC through its ongoing work of 
theory of change workshops with stakeholders is an example of how we enable spaces that can open dialogues and enable opportunities for collective action that can enable and influence change. Thank you, Aiden. Thanks, Sandra. Um, so we were hoping to be able to discuss uh, a few other things, but being a short of the presentation, we won't be able to go into greater depth about uh, methods or findings related to the stresses uh, that women face having to travel for education or the financial laws and barriers for women's engagement for vocational education and employment, for example. Um, but of course, we're happy to answer these in the Q&A and also uh, APTC will be launching on their website the final report very soon. Um, we were hoping to have it up by today and it may actually be up by the close of business. So please feel free to, to uh, visit that at will and of course ask questions in the Q&A. Um, now I'll hand over to Geraldine for some reflections from DFAT on where APTC's approach fits within the Australian government's gender investment context. Gary. Hello, everybody. Can you see me? Am I joining you? You're great. Thanks, Geraldine. Yeah, great. Sorry. Okay. Um, thank you both for that presentation. And it's just so exciting to see the work that APTC has undertaken and uh, the initiative also to commission this work and do it as a co-research with La Trobe University because it's obviously informing practices and um, ways of doing business going forward. But I just want to quickly talk about the Australian government um, sort of context for uh, gender investment. The Australian government's had a long-term investment in gender equality and uh, women's empowerment. And as we all know, women in the Pacific have uh, fewer assets, have less access to credit, earn less than men and bear the disproportionate burden of unpaid care work. And we all know that educating girls and women improves labour market outcomes, reduces poverty, delays marriages and reduces mortality and fertility rates and increases the GDP. So that's why we... Uh, with the Australian government want to partner with uh, regional organisations such as APTC, the Pacific Community and the Pacific Island Forum to advance gender equality priorities. Um, we also work directly with Pacific governments. So some of the areas where you were talking about uh, policy reform, we're working actively with governments to um, address gender equality issues through a range of um, fora, including sort of law and justice, health and education. So it's something where we're all working collectively. We also work with civil society organisations and multilateral organisations uh, such as the UN so that we can um, address and work with shifting sort of social norms. So APTC is part of this mosaic and it's vital that gender equality is mainstreamed through all of the APTC's operations and this research is sort of a big part of um, creating an enabling environment for students and staff. Another way uh, that APTC is working with their students, of course, is to create employment pathways. And this is something where uh, the Australian government is also trying to dovetail and create uh, employment pathways through the Pacific uh, Labor Mobility Scheme. And since the program restarted in uh, September last year, with the onset of COVID, there was a, a hiatus in the program. Over 600 women have arrived in Australia to work. And so we'll be working with the APTC to um, support more opportunities for women who are graduates to move into uh, the Pacific Labor Mobility Program to work in Australia, and hopefully also through the aged care sector as well. So I just want to congratulate APTC and La Trobe University on the study that they have done and that we're already seeing the benefits of that flow through the organisation for both students and staff. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for such a fascinating presentation by um, Aidan, Alessandra and Geraldine. And thank you so much for keeping time so well. I was quite um, encouraged to see this being supported by the Australian government, but also that it is basically action research combined with applied work on the ground. 
we actually have a question. So um, by Tan Min Sui, and the question is, how do you create the environment for women to involve in TVET program? Now, I know you've talked partially about it, but if there's anything you have to add to that question, please go ahead. Yeah, so, th so thank you so much uh, for that question, Tan. Um, there, are, there are a few different things. I mean, it, it really is an ecosystem that you, that you have to create. So um, one of the things that this research looked at was actually the strategies that women have successfully employed throughout the Pacific or the, um, the supports that they've received that help. So um, one of the things that, that we found, or two, two of the major barriers are, um, kind of the the need to attend to family life and the home, the expectation that women will care for their family, even if they're pursuing um, education and employment, whether that's vocational or otherwise. Um, and so there needs to be support from the family, but also sometimes there needs to be financial incentives, so scholarships, stipends, these sorts of things. So there, there are a range of factors that, that can kind of play into that. Um, and then the, the other one is just kind of more broadly around the social norms. So um, we identify individual cases of success, but the, the broader um, picture is one of, of repeated challenges. So, um, so there are certain things that we've recommended to, to try to start to, to change the, the story, change the narrative that will hopefully address some of those social issues. Um, but again, more than happy to discuss uh, those uh, at, at greater length um, if you want to contact one of us by email and I'll put my email in the chat as well. Thank you so much Aidan and uh, while there's another question I wonder whether you're able to answer that one um, in writing given the time because I don't want to disadvantage the last paper by going last. Um, so let's just all thank again our three presenters for a fascinating project. I look forward for the report. So please share the report once it comes out, maybe with our community as well. And thanks, Aidan, for answering that question online. So thanks, um, Aidan, Alessandra, and Geraldine again. The last but not least, um, we have a paper um, by two gentlemen working with ABC International. Um, on journalism capacity building through the localized training initiative in South Pacific during COVID-19. Very timely. And um, Prashant uh, Pillai manages monitoring evaluation and research at ABC International Development. And he's published in the fields of political science, media and communication. And his area of research expertise lies in digital media studies and international development. And he holds a PhD in political communication with Monash University. So I should have said Dr. Pillay. Vipul Kozla is the design and evaluation lead at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's Division for International Development. He's responsible for the design and evaluation of all project activities and, it's, and is the project director, director on the Pacific Media Assistance Scheme. And before joining ABC, he worked with BBC Media Action in London. And he holds a Master of Science in Media and Communication from London Schools of Economy. I don't want to take more of your time, so please, Prashant and Vipul, um, we look forward to your presentation. There's already some questions out there, so you have to see what we can answer live versus what you may want to respond. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Suzanne. Just before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we all are and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm Vipul Khosla and as Suzanne mentioned, I work with ABC International Development uh, around journalism capacity building. And before I start the paper, I also want to acknowledge all the fellow panelists and attendees and thank them for their time and mentioned that this research project was uh, is is a part of the monitoring and evaluation learning for our regional program pacific media assistance scheme which is supported by the australian department for foreign affairs and trade so in terms of the flow of the presentation i will start with the context touch on the methodology and limitations 
and then pass on to Prashant to talk about the findings. To start with the contextual story, as most of you might be aware, working in the Pacific, uh, Pacific as a region has been one of the least affected regions around COVID-19 in terms of case numbers. But it is another story when we look at the economic and social impacts of COVID-19 in the region. And so the reported cases, uh, particularly in the South Pacific, there have been active cases in Fiji and PNG and we are watching the situation as it evolves. Uh, there has been response to the COVID-19 scenario in terms of border shutdowns, uh, travel restrictions, lockdowns and contact tracing, uh, but the situation is still unfolding uh, over a year since, since the pandemic started. And we've been looking at how we adapt and work in the scenario and what the context means for the media and communication landscape as well. So we know, as I mentioned, the social and economic impacts of COVID-19 have been significant uh, as per estimates by the PIF Secretariat. We do know that the economies are contracting. There's a predicted decline of 5.9% in the GDP for the Pacific. And the economies have been significantly impacted largely because of the contraction of tourism, but also the impact on fisheries and trade in the region. All this is manifesting in and has had impact on the media and journalism sector as well. So we've been seeing that there have been significant layoffs that are happening across the globe. In the sector, there have been significant cutbacks, particularly in the print sector. And uh, unfortunately, some of the publications and outlets are ceasing to exist. And we're seeing some of that manifest in the Pacific as well. So we are witnessing falling revenues and cutbacks to newsrooms in the current scenario. Social media has taken on a significant role in the landscape as well as traditional media is under stress. And it's playing a double-edged role in terms of providing and being a source of information. Uh, where some of the digital first responders are providing rapid information around crisis response. But there's also the issue of misinformation or fake news disinformation that has emerged in the region and has impacted some of the crisis response in the region as well. And as part of the response and addressing some of these issues, uh, we at ABC International Development have also been tracking some of the social media conversations in the South Pacific and I can share the link for those uh, in the chat later. And we've seen the conversation evolve over the months and, and the year. Uh, from At the start, there was confusion about protocols, about what remains open, what remains closed, which moved on to discussion about economic impacts. And more recently, there's been discussion around the vaccines. We've also seen rise of bots on Twitter, which has impacted some of the misinformation landscape as well. So in this entire context, what does localization mean? And what does localization of journalism training and content mean in the South Pacific? We acknowledge that localization as a process has been impacted or has taken on a new impetus uh, in the humanitarian response space. And that it has been very much focused around addressing the needs of affected population by acknowledging and involving national or local actors in, in action. And COVID-19 is presenting this dual scenario of almost a double disaster, particularly for the Pacific, considering that the region is prone to natural disasters uh, alongside a pandemic that's unfolding as well. What we have been seeing is that there has been a re affirmation of the importance of traditional media as well, despite the stress on the media, because of the importance of accurate information in the current landscape. And while there have been travel restrictions, there has been a greater need or demand for remote training and support in country. So local trainers have had to step up and uh, address some of these needs in the region. And it has expedited that whole localization process as well. 
and then they are adapting the regional information, the international information to meet the needs of their own audiences in the local landscape. Just some empirical background to this particular study. So the PACMAS program, uh, the Pacific Media Assistance Scheme had launched a training of trainers program pre-COVID, which was focusing around economic and business reporting, and which was trying to build capacity in country of uh, local journalism trainers. And they were offered training, the participants were offered training and mentoring to develop their skills as trainers. And this came in quite handy as COVID struck. Uh, obviously this work was happening pre-COVID and responding to the need that we have come across over the years around need for local trainers and need for local training capacity in country. So we had to adapt and launch a local training program based on some of the capacity building work that we were already doing. But the work and the body of program that was launched around the COVID-19 trainings was very much led by the local trainers and the demand for trainings in country. And so it wasn't a standardized program. It was very much based on the needs in country. And we have collated the data from across the multiple COVID-19 trainings that have been led by local trainers in the region to actually assess how the skills transfer has worked, uh, what have been the professional development outcomes for the journalists and for the journalism trainers, and also looking at how the content in region has been impacted through the process. The training has spanned across the seven countries as listed on the slide. So in terms of methodology, we have looked at 11 locally led trainings over the past year. We've had 202 respondents and we have done a meta-analysis around the responses across the different trainings and themes that have emerged from there. And we've also collated and triangulated findings from an impact assessment that we recently did that touch upon some of these areas as well. And briefly touching on the limitations of the study we do know that this is only a cross section of a work. So, you know, the sample of trainings is obviously very focused uh, around COVID-19 response and hence does not represent the overall impact or uh, scope of pack mass activities. Uh, the majority of feedback is based on self-assessments. And so the limitations of self-assessments also apply in the scenario. And while COVID-19, while South Pacific countries have largely been COVID-free, we have looked at the journalistic impact on taking into account the social and economic impacts of COVID-19 in the region. So I'll hand over to Prashant here to walk us through the findings and the scope of training activities. Prashant. Thanks, Ripple. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, Ripple, if you could just move to the next slide, will be. Thank you so much. In terms of um, the to main topical themes that our trainings have covered, uh, firstly, we looked at public health messaging. Um, we also looked at the business and economic social impact areas and also around COVID safe industry um, practices. In the interest of time, we might sort of just go straight to the uh, findings, if that's okay. So the first was around localized uh, training impacts. Um, and really what we found was the reframing of the hyperlocal. So with the onset of COVID-19, there has been an influx of information at a global scale through social media and mass media. Um, and journalists at the front line of global news breaks, they tend to face increasing pressure to actually contextualize these stories within a sort of a national context. Um, so we found that local elect trainings really guided participants to revisit local issues through um, alternative angles. Um, and having said that, there was a renewed focus on the hyperlocal context, specifically in topics around substance agriculture, um, community market operations, raw material supplies, and also regional travel. Um, and obviously having locally uh, led discussions and trainings meant that um, in countries without COVID-19 cases, um, there was a priority on information and messaging around preparedness in the event of a local outbreak. Uh, just moving on to the next slide, thank you. In terms of local local governmental involvement in workshops, uh, we found there's a general sentiment that uh, locally led workshops would be further enriched 
with representatives and spokespeople from local ministries, NGOs, and civic organizations. Um, there was a general desire for a greater understanding of uh, public health policy priorities to further inform media reporting angles. But having said that, uh, the media were also keen to provide government institutions with a summary of the information needs um, around the COVID-19 health response. And really we found that roundtable discussions between both parties were, were sort of seen as a vital part of this process. Uh, just moving to the next uh, slide, thank you. In terms of nurturing early career journalists, and this was another interesting theme that we found. So early career journalists were often viewed um, as being central to the industry movement towards remote journalism. Um, they were sort of seen as front runners in terms of applying and understanding technical skills um, so it's associated with things such as uh, Zoom-based interviewing and the online curation of information. So there was an overarching sense of mutual respect across the hierarchy of professional experience. Um, and this was really art articulated clearly in the locally led trainings where peer-to-peer -peer support was sort of seen as being really important, um, especially during the pandemic. Let's move into the next one. So we also found uh, the notion of mentorship and mentoring was seen as a crucial component. The opportunity to connect with local trainers after the workshop um, allowed training participants to really clarify specific technical concepts. Um, and this was largely around data journalism um, and COVID-19 reporting more broadly. It should be briefly noted that here that PACMAS and some of the other programs we manage at ABC International Development um, have also provided opportunities for Pacific based journalists to connect with ABC journalists um, in specific fields such as climate change and business and economics. Um, should we just go to the next one? Thank you. So local trainers were aware as well of their status as role models for good journalism practice, um, especially around ethical reporting and of championing accurate um, and verified information dissemination. So given their local prominence and knowledge of the local landscape and their pre-existing you know, professional relationships with, the, with participants, it wouldn't be a surprise that they have considerable influence in actually initiating positive local change in how reporting is conducted. And we can just go to the next one. So this is a sort of second stream of findings around localized content streams, um, moving to the... So these are sort of participant views on the importance of localized content. Um, so in our analysis, we, while, so, sorry, just, my, my screen is freezing at the moment. Um, so the, yeah, okay. So the ability to produce locally relevant content was important to training participants. Uh, what we found really, it served as a bridge um, to connect global issues to uh, local issues as well. Um, and we'll just, I think it'll be illustrated more clearly in the next slide if we want to move on. So firstly, one of the interesting sort of highlights was that we discovered an increasing appetite for content experimentation. And much of this involves exploring the viability of cross-platform content uh, across radio and online platforms that draw on traditional modes of storytelling as well. Interestingly, Vanuatu, Fiji, and Samoa were countries where this sentiment was particularly strong. Um, should we just go to the next one? So, so these are some quotes. We can just probably we'll revisit this at some point later on, but if we could just move on to the next. Hmm. So the last point was on fostering regional and local uh, sorry, international connections. So there was more focus on international connections and respondents noted that connecting with journalists based in other nations and regions was vital in discovering, uh, discovering international perils. Um, and this was largely in relation to tourism, especially when you consider countries like Venice, uh, cities like Venice and islands like Hawaii, where there's a strong tourism sector as well, and they were equally impacted as well as the Pacific. So there are a lot of perils to be learned as well, and trainers sort of saw the benefit of actually connecting with these international communities. Uh, just moving on to the next one. Uh, we also touched on grassroots coll collaboration in combating misinformation. This was really about a more holistic approach towards combating misinformation and connecting with local organizations and NGOs um, and making it a whole community level effort in sort of combating this uh, infodemic, so to speak. We can go to the next one very quickly. Maybe we'll skip this one as well. Oops. So obviously there were professional opportunities uh, for regional training. I've just been told that uh, Suzanne would like to sort of end this, but largely just to sort of wrap it up, what we see is sort of a conceptual through line between local trainings, local content and regional and international um, collaboration. And uh, really 
in some ways going local and focusing on locally led capacity building and, and sort of addressing the training needs of local communities uh, was really the most sustainable route towards reaching, achieving global interconnectedness. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And apologies for being pushy at the end, but I, no I, I was just coordinating as well with our organizers, given that there's a break coming after this. I was able to claw back some time from the break because we actually have quite a lot of questions. So, you know, if some of you do feel a break, you know, it is up to you to leave. Otherwise, please stay on for a couple more minutes with us. Now, there are actually five questions. There were two um, put into the Q&A this morning um, that are not showing on this one here. And there are three that were, were put right now. So why don't we maybe go with the questions of the people that are here today um, that put it just now in, but you may wanna, um, if I ask the presenters to look at the questions that we have um, around um, in, in the Q&A space around the panel to answer them maybe live uh, later in question. So we have questions about, um, we have a question, well, but now we've got four questions actually. So we may have to see which one you can answer. Um, live right now. I'll quickly summarize them and maybe later you can just give more longer answers in, in, um, in response. So one of my colleagues is asking, um, Whitney Yip from the RDI Network is asking about the training utility of types of different mediums for journalism or leading towards traditional journalism. So she's looking, you know, how innovative your training is. An anonymous um, attendee asked why PNG seems to not have been included despite being the biggest island. And Ali, Alicia Dunas is asking about um, the notion of two-way capacity building and how Pacific participants noticed ways in which their Australian partners learned and improved shifted approaches. Um, and Anthena Ramos is interested in the infrastructure you needed. Um, to have these long distance capacity, capacity building relationships. And Corinne Podger is asking, um, which was actually put in, I think, this morning to know about um, the, the medi, me, media development space and about capacity strengthening in 2022. And then there was a question about media freedom and how, how that has impacted and no guarantees of media freedom on your work. So a lot of questions, I tried to summarize them quickly. So perhaps if you could give a very quick summary response now, maybe one minute each of you and then answer a longer question um, since we're already going over time, which probably says a lot about me as a chair. So please, I know I was very quick summarizing these questions. So I hope you got the essence of it. And you can just pick one or two and answer longer questions later. Yeah, so I can kind of touch on why PNG is not included in there. Uh, PACMAS as a regional program focuses on all Pacific countries except PNG. PNG, we do work on PNG, but that's done through a separate media development program. And so there have been similar things that have been done in PNG, but through a separate program, not necessarily through PACMAS. And that is the reason why PNG is not included in this analysis. In terms of the infrastructure needs around some of the remote capacity building, I think one of the reasons why we shifted to local training and capacity development was because of the infrastructure challenges in doing remote training. And so what we've been able to do is work with a small cohort of Pacific trainers to actually build their capacity, who then in turn have de delivered this training face-to-face -face in country. Uh, but there are definitely infrastructure challenges in, in particular countries, even using platforms like Zoom. And so we've been very cognizant of that and have supported our participants around providing that infrastructural support. Prashant, did you want to take up any of the questions? I uh, can't quite remember the, all of them, but as a general overarching point, I think, um, you know, a lot of these trainings, locally at trainings, uh, just to make the point again, we're, we're, we're done in consultation with local Pacific media houses and media organizations as well, um, from their design right up to their scope um, and the topics as well. So it was really a two-way learning process, um, even for the ABC journalists as well, um, where those who had sort of mentored um, Pacific-based journalists had learned quite a bit uh, just around Pacific culture and uh, the, the scope and 
to the focus of the, uh, the media industry as well and how they've been infected, impacted by COVID-19. So it, it really served sustainable for, for two sides of the coin, um, both local in Australia and also in the Pacific. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. And yeah, please feel free to drop us a line on who or we can leave our email addresses here as well if you want to get in touch or want to discuss further. You can actually see the other questions as well. Um, uh, if you look on the Q&A, so there was this question about, I'm not sure that the, the media development space uh, in the infrastructure, I'm not sure whether that has fully been answered and whether you're doing more innovative journalism. Those were the other three things left. I think the other ones were answered. I can give you another minute. <laughs> uh, Ripple, did you want to address this? Uh, I think, uh, sorry, I can't see the questions for some reason, but on the innovation space, I think as Prashant touched in the presentation and Prashant, you may be able to elaborate a bit on this, uh, is definitely the different formats that have been considered the rise of digital spaces has been quite interesting and particularly uh, from the point of view of the newer generation or the new entrants in the space of journalism and how this whole opportunity has actually created a space for them to be able to display their skills and as digital natives or kind of the generation that has grown up with these platforms uh, responding to some of this information needs online. Did you wanna add anything there Prashant? Sure, um, just in connection to that as well, we, we generally saw an openness, uh, a greater sensitivity to, to data driven journalism as well. Um, there's this level of uh, acceptance that, you know, the future will be data driven in some respects, but especially with COVID-19, um, that focus on data has sort of taken the next level. And we are sort of seeing that focus in the trainings as well. And it sort of bodes well in the future as well, um, in terms of planning activities as well with, uh, with the data focus in this. Yeah, I think onto that. Thank you. All right, I see that we can't answer all the questions try to address the ones you've had so they were still but I mean thank you for the two authors for um, saying that there's a possibility to take this offline and contact them um, either you know on the Hoover platform or through emails um, there was a last question on trust if you've noticed anything about trust around you know um, we want to take that one as a closing one and then otherwise I think I should let people go into a deserved break as well because we then have we have a very tight schedule here I would very generous that we tacked on some more. Yeah, we've definitely seen uh, issues around trust in media, around sources of information, and it's been uh, moving both ways. So there has been an increased trust in social media or kind of engagement on social media, but there's also then been this whole uh, reaffirmation of trust in traditional media space. Uh, and so it's it's, a sort of a moving feast at the moment and we don't really know how this will settle down at the end of the pandemic but it's definitely worth watching and, and there are shifts happening in that space so it's definitely something to look into a bit more all right um i see that things are coming and so i wonder whether we're losing people so i just want to thank again the last um two presenters and thanks again, you know, for all the engaging questions at their space. It's always hard to run um, three brilliant papers in an hour's space. So thank you to um, Prashant and thank you to Vipul. But I also want to thank again to all the other presenters so far. Again, thank you, Aidan, Alessandra, Geraldine, as well as Daniel for all these great presentations. This is recorded, so you can always go back and watch the recording. Feel free to contact each of the presenters through the Hoover platform and continue your conversation. And, um, and as most of you have also put some contact details in there. So thank you so much for that. So I wanna thank you. I want you to stay with us um, for a little break right now, a refresh and come back um, for, the, uh, uh, for our plenary presentation uh, that is very briefly, I think it is 12.45. So please stay with us and engage in the brilliant programs today. Thank you, everybody.